Good evening. It's uh, the second Wednesday of the month, and uh, we're here at 585 Pine Street for the uh, monthly meeting of the Burlington Board of Electric Commissioners. Um, as you as it says, it meets at 530 here at 585 Pine. As always, the public is welcome to come join us, join in the conversation. Um, and so here we go. We'll start uh, with the first item on the agenda, which is the agenda. And it looks like we have one change to the agenda in that we will not be having the IRP update because James is sick. So item number 10 has been taken off the agenda. We added 6A. And we added 6A, which is a, the right, financials for July. Can I so we'll go this other piece, executive session? So we'll go both over yeah. June and July this evening. And we're going into executive session. <coughs> and we got an executive session. Okay. So I guess we got a few different, <laughs> few, few different things going on here. <coughs> All right. So it sounds the like agenda. James is trying to say something. Is James trying to speak? James is saying the volume is low. Volume is low? It's being fixed huh? It's being fixed right We're fixing it right now, James. Okay. Um, next is the uh, minutes of the July 12th, 2023 meeting. Um, barring any, um, excuse me, are there any uh, substantial changes to or, or corrections to the minutes of July 12th? Uh, hearing none, I'll, I'll entertain a motion. Make the motion to approve July 12th, 2023 meeting. Minute meeting. No. Yeah. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all, 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 all in favor of, the, of approving the minutes of July 12th, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Four ayes. Uh, motion passes. Um, <clears throat> on to number three. Number three is the public forum. This is a chance for the members of the public, uh, both online and in, and in person, to uh, come up and speak to the board and uh, have any uh, concerns, praise, whatever. The, it's, all, it's all fairly open game. Uh, see, we have uh, one person here with us in the audience. Do we have anybody online from the public? No. no. Sir, it is your, your, your ball game if you wish to speak. Oh, no, just here listening. Thank you. All right, well, thank, thank you for joining us. We don't often get... I'm kind of deaf, but I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. We don't yeah, often get uh, yeah. too many members of the public here uh, to come in and, and listen and, and join us. Um, certainly, if you have any other questions, if you have something, if what comes up later on, we're Absolutely. more than happy to give you a chance to, to speak up. All right, so we'll move on from public forum to Commissioner's Corner, number four. This is a chance for... Com and always, uh, again, back to uh, public forum, Public always welcome here, second Wednesday of the month, 585 Pine. Please come share your thoughts, your ideas, your concerns, where that's what we're open to listening to and, and working on. <clears throat> All right, on to Commissioner's Corner. This is an opportunity for commissioners to uh, have a say on something that they may have seen or done, or whatever, the, something that's come up in the last month. And so I opened the floor to commissioners for a comment. I noted in the notes <coughs> reference to battery technology for the South 40. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the meeting, if somebody could say something about that. It's a I'd be happy to touch on it briefly now if you'd like. Um, my understanding is there is interest by the project uh, owner, uh, the South 40 Solar, um, to look at adding battery storage there and working with our team to evaluate what the economics would look like. Um, so. Uh, we've had a few different opportunities where we've tried to consider utility scale battery storage around the community. We're, we're continuously evaluating that. Uh, so this one was brought to us and could be a good opportunity. We'll definitely be interested, but our, our kind of continued pitch for battery storage is it has to pencil for us um, in terms of, you know, particularly peak reduction uh, opportunities because unless it's part of a microgrid and there's some resiliency component, which I don't know that there would be in this case, it will get some value from other services, but peak reduction I think is gonna be the main one. And um, so maybe with some of the inflation reduction credits, uh, we'll have some economics that are favorable. Thanks. Other commissioner items? Nope. All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to number five on the agenda, which is the G General Manager update with General Manager Springer. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Good to be back after our break in August. Um, uh, I'll start with, uh, you know, our electric bucket truck. Some good news. Uh, hope, I hope you all maybe had a chance to see it. Um, it's definitely been out in the community. 
Um, and uh, we are working through a couple little issues with the chargers, uh, getting those kind of squared away. Uh, but it is able to charge. Uh, it's going to be popular at a number of events, uh, including our Net Zero Energy Festival. Um, I believe it may also be at the REV conference and at one other event. A lot of people, as it's the first one in the state, people want to be able to see it and check it out. Um, our line crew, uh, Kieran in particular, did a great job at the press event explaining. Sorry. Oh. Um, explaining, uh, you know, kind of how it works. Uh, did a demo in the bucket, uh, went up about 60 feet in the air, it seemed like, uh, and um, was able to kind of talk through how that works. You know, one of the things he shared at the press event was that there, you know, there's a separate battery, obviously, for the uh, bucket system compared to the propulsion system. And then there's even a backup battery within the bucket that if somehow you were ignoring charging the bucket and you got stuck up there, there's a backup battery that then can kind of bring it back down. So uh, a lot of interesting redundancies for this type of truck. Uh, we shared some of the news clips uh, in the in the report. We're really excited to see it rolling through the community and glad you all got a chance to check it out. Um, uh, mentioned the Net Zero Festival. I want to mention again, Net Zero Festival, uh, September 23rd, rain date September 24th. Uh, we're continuing to add uh, to all of the things that were listed in the uh, report, I believe our latest addition is that we will have Ben and Jerry's scooping ice cream from a fossil fuel free Tesla. Um, so we're, we're happy for that. Um, we will have fossil fuel free uh, food trucks. We'll have Champ. Uh, we're going to be raffling away an e-bike uh, courtesy of BSCCU, our sponsor. Uh, the bike is from North Star Sports. Uh, we'll have an electric lawn trimmer also raffle, uh, Ego uh, model uh, from Ace. Uh, so we're happy to have their support. Um, we're going to have two live bands and one DJ throughout the event. Uh, the city fleet of EVs will be present. We're going to have EV test drives and e-bike test rides. Uh, we'll have lots of bike parking, uh, local motion. Uh, so all kinds of great things going on, uh, heat pumps, solar vendors, others. Uh, so we're obviously, we welcome the entire commission to join us at any point during the day. The time changed from last year. It was 9 to 1. Now it's 10 to 2. Uh, which we think will be a little bit better aligned uh, for, for having folks uh, join us. And the uh, also happening this year will be the first ever uh, Net Zero Energy Award uh, at the event. Um, ITA, our energy equity uh, project analyst, has worked with Betsy, who's here, uh, from McNeil, and we're designing a very unique award uh, with help from the generator. Uh, and we took nominations uh, from the community uh, for different individuals and organizations that are uh, making progress on our net zero energy goal and uh, demonstrating leadership. So we'll be announcing that as well, I believe, at 1245 on the day of the event. So very exciting stuff coming up on September 23rd uh, for that. Um, also wanted to mention uh, we are waiting for the carbon fee ordinance to have an ordinance committee meeting. It could happen as early as next week. Um, and I don't know if it will be one in a series of meetings or if they're going to plan, you know, to try to resolve it all in one meeting. But uh, that had passed the TUC committee. It's now waiting for the ordinance committee, and then it goes to the full council after that. Uh, the goal is to have it implemented for 2024. Um, we've had a couple, uh, three Defeat the Peak runs now, uh, and I think we're probably done, uh, barring a late kind of late breaking surge of, of further summer weather in September, which is not unprecedented. But uh, we had um, initial one was with Old Spokes Home, uh, and we were able to hit our targets for each of them. Uh, Jen Green uh, was the Jim Reardon Award winner, was able to pick the first uh, nonprofit, picked Old Spokes Home uh, over in the Old North End, um, which is a great uh, bike uh, shop and organization. Um, Agewell and the Intervale Center were our two other ones. We're doing check presentations for those in the near future. Obviously, we want to support the Intervale Center through all the flooding that, that occurred there, and they're a good partner of ours in Agewell, Vermont. Um, the Oral argument uh, took place in the FY23 rate case. Um, we are still waiting, uh, as, as you may see on your bill. Uh, we have now, as you get, I got my bill, I think, yesterday. You'll see a uh, FY23 and an FY24 line item surcharge on the bill. The issue that's been holding us up is a resolution around the Moran frame payments that you all remember. Um, the, the Department of Public Service has been, uh, I think, reasonably supportive of our position. Uh, council at the PUC had raised uh, concerns about the, not so much the current uh, arrangement, but prior 
uh, negotiations around the Moran frame and how those impacted on this current arrangement. So that's kind of what that that was what the oral argument was about in part. Uh, Bill Ellis represented Burlington Electric as he does. He's our PUC counsel. Um, and that took place, and we're now waiting uh, still to get resolution on that in order to make the FY23 rate case part of our rates as opposed to uh, a line item surcharge. Typically, you'd only have one line item surcharge on a bill at a given time, but to the extent you hear about that from anybody or anybody's listening, uh, that's why we have both still is that the 23 rate case is still pending uh, based on that. Um, and then lastly, uh, district energy, I think we – had do we have an agenda item on that separate? Um, we do. Yeah. I'll hold then uh, talking about that. We'll get to it at the agenda item. Um, those were the major updates. I think I saw something over my email flash from James about the solar test center, maybe. Is that right? Um, I think I just saw that. And I'll just mention that the uh, we've talked about this for a while, this McNeil Solar Test Center partnership with UVM. Uh, was just over there today. Uh, the panels are going in. Um, we're looking at trying to establish a commissioning date. Uh, but there's a bunch of solar now in what was the Wastewood Yard area, and the Wastewood Yard's been moved back. Um, so we're, we're excited to open up that project in the near future. I think we're waiting on uh, some a uh, couple items uh, to be able to move forward with commissioning. And Mike will let the commission know when we have a date for the Solar Test Center event. And let me stop there. Questions? She doesn't show with us. Hmm. No questions? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on to item number six on the agenda, the FY20, uh, July 23 and, or June? June and, both June and July's financials. Double whammy. Double shot. It Is it possible to get the yeah. screen share working? Thanks. Is your camera stuck? <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you. No, no, no. I'll get more after. Okay, so let's. Um, all right, so where am I starting? I am starting with the, yes, June. So I wanted to give you the final, not the final, but the June FY23 unaudited preliminary results. Um, these were included in the packet you received in August when we didn't have a meeting. I just wanted to go through them quickly. Um, the numbers here will change as we do. Uh, a few year-end adjustments. Uh, we always have a, a, a pension expense and liability adjustment to make. We always um, have an OPEB uh, adjustment to make after we receive certain actuarial reports. Um, but did we, did we lost lost the <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, just let you in. You bet. Oh. Wait, it was there, now it's gone again. <coughs> Thank you. Um. Sorry, yeah, I hate to be a pain. <laughs> like the OBS keeps trying to. Yeah, there's a little. Okay, thanks. Um, so, as I said, these numbers uh, I do expect to change, but wanted to give you a preview of where they are at the moment. Um, we, uh, due to the adjustment and purchase power that we've discussed before. We're seeking approval within the 2023 rate case to amortize $4.162 million of lost 
revenue from excess sales of winter energy from last winter to amortize that over eight years. And so as a result of that $4.162 million reduction in expense, and then we've added one eighth of that back, because we're gonna spread it over um, eight yeah. years, right? That is the preliminary, that's showing preliminarily um, a positive net income of 3.2 million. It's 2 million better than the budget. So that's kind of where we stand on a net income basis. And then scrolling down, you can see that we ended the year about 88% spent through the capital budget. Um, we went over a little on production uh, due to gas turbine repairs that were unanticipated, and then timing affecting the other projects. And uh, I reported this at our June meeting, but we ended with 4.463 million in operating cash. That was about 200, 217,000 less than we had budgeted to begin FY24 with but it was kind of where we were forecasting to end as we kind of tried to plan where we would land. And then um, you can see here the preliminary um, Moody's rating factors uh, for June 2023 would be an adjusted debt service coverage ratio of 1.28 and 93 days cash on hand. The cash on hand number improved so much because the operating expense number shrank due to the adjustment for the winter energy revenues. Because remember, that's a ratio, right? So we didn't have any more or less cash than we had been forecasting, but our expenses were reduced. And so you can then spread that expense over more days. If it makes sense, or you spread your, your cash over more days because your expense for each day is less. Um, again, those numbers will change as we get, once we get final audited financials, then we'll have an official, you know, official expense numbers and then the ratios will be updated accordingly. So. It's very complicated because it's, because it's like a less revenue, <laughs> right? And so you, but the, because you budgeted for a higher number and you brought in money for less, that gap still has to be accounted for and that's what you spread even though you're talking about the amortization yeah. of the yeah so it's it's in net you know we talk about power supply expense but as commissioner herondine has elucidated before right it's a net number right so it's all the things we're paying related to power supply transmission capacity yeah. purchase power but then it's any revenues we receive for purchase you know in the power supply area right including sale of any excess revenue to the ISO New England when we are, you know, basically when McNeil is online, right, and we have more power at a given moment than we need. So, um, so yeah, it, it doesn't appear on the income statement as revenue, right, but it appears in the expense line as a net to the other purchase, uh, to the other power supply expenses. Right, it reduces those costs. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can amortize costs then because. Yeah. Um, costs are higher than anticipated because revenues were lower than expected, and that's where you get that delta that can then is a hard, no a real number right. that can be spread across. Right, because uh, so the way um, we budgeted according to, or not exactly, the, the budget number and the rate case number weren't the same way, but we take the same approach, right? Just take the same approach to budgeting that we take to the cost of service in the rate case. And the cost of service in the rate case, the methodology that the department advises us to follow that's been supported by the commission is look at the energy forwards at the time you're submitting your rate case. And that's, you know, the cost, that's gonna be the cost of your energy, right? That's accepted as the basis on which to, you know, say, okay, we're gonna spend that much on purchase power. At the time we did the rate case, those forwards were extremely high last summer, as you remember. And so we, we sort of had to kind of <laughs> assume we were going to make all this money from selling this excess um, winter energy at really high prices. We couldn't lower, you know, the, the methodology is use the forwards, right? 
And so that gap between what we were kind of regulatorily required to include in rates versus what we actually collected due to the energy prices we saw was so big, right? And um, we did some analysis to say, you know, what's been the historical variation on the Fords at this point in May or June and what they actually turned out to be, up or down? You know, how many times in the past since the creation of ISO New England has it been this off? Right, have the forwards been that wildly off? And uh, James and Casey Lamont on his team kind of looked back at that, and it's really only happened like once, once in the good direction and one other time in the bad direction. Um, and that's kind of also. Yeah, and that's also how we came up with the eight, eight oh, years, okay. in part. And also, um, it also spreads the effect sort of across, you know across more more rate years, so to speak. Anything to add to that, James, did I? Okay. No, again, if we, we knew this was a problem. We pointed it out when we made the rate filing that the methodology that the department prefers to use exposed us to a lot of risk of lower market prices. And in fact, after we filed the rate case, the department said the four prices have gone up and would argue for an even lower rate case but you know, didn't pursue that. And then in fact, they came in lower than all of those values. So again, it's a, a structural problem and it's, it affects you either if you are long or short energy and it affects you in different directions. So it, it's a known problem in rates, in rate making, I think. Thanks, James. Um, anything else on preliminary FY23? Okay, I'll, with your permission, I'll switch to July FY24 results. So, um, in July, uh, the story, generally speaking, was it was quite warm, and <laughs> energy prices were good, McNeil was online, um, and it rained, so there was water in the river. So that all adds up to, those are the major drivers really in a uh, positive variance to budget of uh, 596,000. We're reporting a net income of 284,000. We had budgeted for a net loss. So we did uh, better than budget in July. You can see sales to customers were up, largely weather driven uh, by 67,000, both commercial and residential uh, classes usage was up. Um, miscellaneous uh, or other revenues on your sheet. Um, this month that's just about all EEU revenues. We didn't have any rec sales this month. Um, that was uh, down versus budget. Um, and then moving down to operating expense, looking at the net power supply expense that's where we can see the effects of the energy prices and McNeil. It's generally, overall, it's a, a positive delta of 289,000. Always some puts and takes within there. Um, fuel was over budget because uh, our wood price was slightly higher than budget and also McNeil ran more than was budgeted. But then on the other side, purchase power was less than budget. Um, because our wind production was down, we had excess energy to sell to ISO, uh, and McNeil and Winooski One were both producing well. Um, transmission was also better than budget, contributing to that positive variance. And then in other operating expense, that too was better than budget by $426,000. Um, mostly timing, it's the first, uh, first month of the fiscal year. In, um, where am I? Other income and deductions, so I'm now just above the bottom, bottom line, a uh, $39,000 um, negative variance, um, so the timing of work order billing and offset by um, a positive unrealized gain on investment. 
questions on the income statement before I move over to capital and cash. <coughs> well, here's another naive one. Going back to the uh, previous uh, chart, uh, we showed a net income of $2 million last year, <coughs> um, uh, sort of saved by that amortization. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, does this make our rate hike look exorbitant? A rate hike request? No, because the um, that adjustment and that amortization was included in the cost of service that we submitted as the basis for our most recent five and a half percent rate request. So even with that betterment or that adjustment, then the we believe anyway the five and a half was more than more than justified, and we had costs that would justify even higher. Now, while well, that's still be investigated and full, you know ultimately determined by the Public Utility Commission, but that was that's the evidence that we have supported in support of our rate filing. Nothing else on that. I'll scroll down. Uh, capital spending early on were about 10% uh, um, of the budget for the year. Actually, we spent ahead of budget um, in this uh, this month, so about a million dollars on our uh, 11, almost 11 million dollar budget. And is there anything? Uh, right, so of note here, this is skewed a little bit. Um, as Darren mentioned, uh, we received our all-electric bucket truck. Um, <coughs> we've paid for the whole thing. We'll get reimbursed for a lot of it from um, the state once we complete all of our, our compliance paperwork. But the, so the full co the capital cost is appearing here, even though that's not going to be um, the cost we ultimately bear. And then uh, moving down to cash, we have 4.8 million, just about 4.8 million dollars um, in operating cash. That's just a little, a touch under our budget amount of 4.9 million dollars. And we have uh, debt service coverage 4.25, adjusted debt ratio 1.48, and 102 days cash on hand at this point in the year. Any questions for me? Okay. All right. Thank you. Very welcome. <coughs> we'll move on to item number seven on our agenda, and that's district heat update with um, General Manager Springer. All right. Um, so we were originally considering whether we needed uh, kind of more full agenda item for this, but update will suffice for the moment. Uh, we had originally planned to potentially have a work session at the City Council uh, as early as September, <coughs> excuse me, 18th. Um, but we've asked to move that back to October 10th uh, to give us a little more time to conclude the discussions around the potential terms of the project, the economics, the financials uh, with the medical center. Um, so we've had a number of different things that are all kind of happening simultaneously. Uh, we've been uh, visiting with some of the MPAs where there's been a request for us to come and talk about district heat. Uh, Jen and I joined Ward 6 last week. I'm going to try to join Ward 1 at least by Zoom this evening. I think they start uh, their forum around 7:10. Uh, so dependent upon this meeting, I may try to join them. Um, and then we have Wards 2, 3 tomorrow, and, uh, and then later in the month we have 4, 7, and there may be others that uh, choose to engage on this as well. Um, we also had the webinar yesterday uh, that I know Commissioner Moody, Commissioner Bond were able to join. Um, the link for the webinar recording is on our website at burlingtonelectric.com slash McNeil. I don't know if any other commissioners were able to, nice. Commissioner Herendine. Okay, so we had three commissioners on uh, for Commissioner Whitaker, Commissioner Shagnon. If you're interested, uh, burlingtonelectric.com slash McNeil. Uh, and it's also on our YouTube page. Uh, it was about a one hour webinar uh, featuring uh, Lund, Sweden, uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, and then St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, as well as the president of the International District Energy Association 
The event was hosted by Linda McGinnis, who's a South Burlington resident, has done work for uh, both the Shumlin and Scott administration on energy and the Obama administration, and is a former World Bank uh, lead economist, so great resource for us in the community, um, and has worked with Energy Action Network uh, and others. Um, so it's a good discussion. Um, it was interesting to hear kind of how they're thinking about it and what their systems are like in these other communities. They're not identical to what we're looking at, but they all use biomass uh, with, um, you know, a district heat and in some cases combined heat and power application. Uh, so we hosted that as just another educational opportunity for the community. We've posted three Q&A documents, which I've also sent to you that are on our website um, that are uh, cited and researched and respond to things that we've heard in the discussion, try to provide some additional information. One's on the McNeil economics, uh, one is on district energy itself, and one's on climate and forestry uh, related to McNeil and the broader discussion. Uh, so at the moment, we are uh, looking at having potential city council work sessions kick off on the 10th. Um, if we do reach a point uh, in the next several weeks where we do have uh, kind of a, a go uh, of trying to move the project forward to the process with the city council, I would anticipate that at our October meeting, uh, we would want to have an agenda item with a full uh, proposal and a potential vote um, at that point from the commission uh, prior to it moving all the way through the council process. Council, as I understand it, would have one, if not two, work sessions prior to actually taking up a vote. So we won't be late at all in the process if the commission looks at it in October. Um, and I'm trying to think, I don't know if there are any other items to provide an update on now, um, but that's kind of what we've been working on, where we are in the process, and uh, glad to answer any questions. Commissioners, any questions? i just make a comment that uh, I've been approached by people who are <laughs> critical of biomass, and I thought, at least in one case, they were burning something like 85% sawdust, uh -huh. and I just wanted to say, boy, wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy? Sure. Yep. No, I think uh, we're closer to around 10% uh, mill residue. Uh, so for our mix as of 2022, and obviously quite a bit coming from tops and limbs and residues uh, within the woods and uh, percent and a half from the waste wood yard. So uh, I did look at our kind of supply mix over a period of time, our fuel mix, and we were at one point closer to 10% low value round wood. Now we're about 0.3% low value round wood. So to the extent that folks are concerned about that, um, there's been a move kind of in that direction away from low value round wood at McNeil, which is uh, mainly for fuel security purposes. If you can't get in the woods during mud season, have that on hand. Um, and I think we have a fairly favorable mix of fuel when it comes to climate payback. Um, but you know, these are all issues that get discussed, debated. I'm under no illusion that we'll reach a consensus uh, on these topics necessarily within the community. Um, and district energy doesn't necessarily require us to. It's more of a narrow question around if we have this facility, do we want to improve it? Do we want to increase the efficiency? Do we want to utilize it to help uh, reduce commercial sector natural gas use by a substantial amount? Um, it doesn't really require us to change the operational dynamics of McNeil or the wood inputs for McNeil. It's really about improving the facility. And uh, I hope we get to that discussion because I'd, I'd be uh, excited to, for us to bring this after long last to a potential positive conclusion, but more work to be done. So are there any public and community engagement requirements as part of this, as part of District Energy, or is it just an agreement between you all, at, well, BED and UVM? Well, certainly, um, I don't know if there are requirements, but we're, we're trying to visit with the MPAs to really, uh, you know, enhance <laughs> public engagement. We hosted the webinar in part to uh, engage, and obviously there were folks in the chat who didn't agree with the project mm -hmm. or had, had different views, and they expressed those, obviously, as they should. Um, but uh, so we've had those opportunities. We did the Took Forum back in uh, June as another public engagement opportunity. And my understanding is there'd be potentially three city council meetings where this would be a topic of discussion, the work sessions, and then a potential vote, as well as the commission meeting next month. So a uh, significant amount of public process around it. Um, but ultimately, um, the ask would be really around a more narrow set of things. It would really be around, uh, if we're successful with the project, bringing it forward, would be around creating uh, approval to have an agreement to provide steam from McNeil for the district energy system, what the parameters of that look like, any potential incentives that BED might offer as a part of that. Those are the hooks and the pieces that would really be within sort of the commission and the council's uh, jurisdiction to look at. 
and to decide upon. Okay, because I think it, I mean, I know there's a, like this public opinion piece going on in the community, but it's so technical, like even the Q and A's and everything, it, it's really a conversation between just a handful of people. Yeah. And maybe that's, maybe that's fine, but um, I do think like some simplifying it and making it a little more accessible to more people might be a good thing. Yeah, it's, it's a complex topic and I agree that, I don't think most of the community is engaged on this, uh, so, despite yeah. whatever efforts we're, we're just talking about. Not everyone attends an MPA meeting, not everyone's gonna attend a webinar. Uh, a lot of people I talk to in the community aren't even aware we're really looking at this or that there's any potential debate around it, uh, for good or bad. And um, I do think if it moves to the council that that will have a unique opportunity to focus the discussion and for us to try to present it in as clear and concise a way as possible. Um, the MPA presentation I have is, is just 10 slides. Um, I'd be happy to share it with the commission as well, just for your, your reference. Um, I've tried to get better at speaking about this in a way that is concise and relatable and understandable, uh, but it has many distinct, deep technical areas where we can get into a level of detail that may be uh, important, but less helpful for that. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, because I think most people just need to know, is it the right thing to do or not? I would say yes, but right? that's and probably I mean, not good <laughs> enough for everybody. <laughs> um, and just like a few, a, a few yeah, I, I get it, it's really complicated. Yeah. And I think in general, like this, that energy conversations feel really important, but people are just not accessible to most people. Yeah, no, and I think the other benefit, if we are able to move forward with the October discussion, um, is we'll be able to get more detail on the financial pieces of it, what that looks like, because we haven't been at, at ability, we don't have an ability to discuss that now while we're discussing the terms. So if we get to that point, we'll have more clarity that we can offer on that. And I do think that, um, you know, we don't have to resolve every aspect of the debate around biomass writ large, because that's a broader conversation. I think if we come to the conclusion, which I certainly believe, that we are not in a position where we would want to shut down the McNeil plant because we need it for reliability, it provides a really important economic benefit, but more importantly, uh, it's providing energy at a time where we would otherwise be reliant on natural gas. And I believe that with our fuel mix, there's a carbon benefit to having McNeil relative to burning fossil fuel. If we agree on that, that we need McNeil for the foreseeable future because there's not a but renewable I think even alternative. even that nugget right there is very, is is, should be, we should be able to communicate that simply. Right, but if we agree on that, then the question becomes very different. Um, right. And, and you've, you've removed some of the extraneous discussion that, that is good and, and is happening, but isn't actually what we're debating here. We're not debating whether to build a biomass plant. We're right. not debating uh, all those aspects of But that's of that. a lot of what the, the challenge in the community is it. And then I think people don't understand it and they see steam and they think, they think it's pollution and it's not. Right. Yeah. And so I think it's some of those just really simple, basic things. And then what does it mean to me as a ratepayer? Am I going to pay less or more? Or is it no impact? Right. I think like there's, and I think, you know, because a lot of these Q&As are like three, two or three pages and they're really dense and, yep. um, yeah. And they could be graphic. Yeah. We've tried, we tried a number of things and we'll keep trying. Yeah. Um, but ultimately it's going to come down to uh, having to bring the question to the appropriate forums and present the best information we can. But I will share the MPA slides. You may okay. find those I am in Ward more one, digestible. Yeah. You're okay. in Ward 1? Yeah. Oh, so yours is this evening then. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't going to do slides there. We didn't have a formal presentation, but there's a public forum between 710 and 740. So if I have the chance, I was just going to drop in and, you know, introduce ourselves again and, and the topic. But um, I'll email you all the slides. Okay. <clears throat> you recall it several years ago, I did a little presentation I do. On the biomass question. And, uh, you know, when I hear the discussion, uh, I say, well, yeah, it's complicated, but there's just two fundamental concepts that handles it all. <clears throat> Lags and where you bound the question. So you just tell people that and that you take care of everything. But as soon as you look into what, it, what those mean, it gets very complicated fast. Um, anyway, if I have anything, I think I can add to your slides, I'll let you know. <laughs> Please. No, we'd welcome your feedback. I appreciate it. I'll email them out tonight so you have them. You can take a look. Other questions? So these slides are the five-minute yeah. version, so <laughs> they'll, they'll be more concise than the Q&As. Sir, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask a question. Excuse me, sir? I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, I don't have any questions right now. I'm just, I'm new to it. I'm interested. 
I'm from the Bob Young days, Alan Yandow. Sure. So, thank you. I mean, it's, but it's I, been, I hope to come to your uh, October meeting okay. uh, and learn. I appreciate uh, Scott. I do. We appreciate you coming too. That's why you know there's been a lot I, of things I said here. I respect for the, the work you're doing and be do, he's doing. I do. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure that yeah. I'm disappointed that it seems like I'm the only one from public here. You know, it's it's sad. You know, being uh, you know, Burn is a so-called progressive town that there are not more citizens here. You know, it's discouraging. But you know, what can I do? We agree. There's 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 not often a, 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 a lot of public engagement here, yeah. <clears throat> and, I, and I'm kind of surprised given that that there is is much uh, public discourse on this particular subject yeah. that not more people yeah. are here. So we appreciate you showing up, and that's why yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to ask a question or two. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Are there any more questions on this topic? If not, all right. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to. Uh, the public EV charger deployment plan. Emily? And Paul. And Paul. to share with you uh, the results of um, kind of a month's long effort mm -hmm. internally here at BED um, to think about where we want to put public EV chargers in the city. Um, we have been deploying them right along since about 2014 or 12? 13. 13. Maybe a little bit than that, yeah. Okay. Um, but with the adoption of the net zero plan, uh, with the uh, issuance and approval of the 22 revenue bond, um, part of that was, was to increase um, EV charging deployment in the city. And we didn't really have a long-term plan, right, for locations, for how many uh, we need to support charging over time. So this group of folks from sustainability, uh, technicians, engineering, policy and planning, communications, energy services, and distribution got together this spring mostly and kind of really kind of put together more of a strategy. And so just wanted to update the commission on the results of that. This was also the basis for this work was the basis for the uh, application we submitted for a Department of Transportation grant to fund EV charging. Uh, so generally what we did was um, uh, Freddie Hall on the policy and planning team, um, the way policy and planning actually had an, an intern or a fellow, I should say, a graduate fellow from the University of New Hampshire two summers ago, um, did some work with Freddie on projecting out how many chargers do we think we'll need in Burlington over time given certain assumptions around the number of EVs that will be on the road over those years. And then we came up with criteria for ranking or pri prioritizing spots in the community. And we kind of ranked neighborhoods around those criteria, brainstormed a list, scored the lists, and then kind of put them on a map and then sort of looked at them visually, right, to sort of uh, validate or tweak our, um, our scoring and our thinking about where they should go. This is, um, I can't go very deep on this slide because this is getting into Freddie's model, yeah, which right. is quite complicated. Um, but he did use a regression model. Um, and so the key thing is uh, it assumes growth in EVs of about 25% a year. Um, we are planning to put about 80% of the ports at the level two level, 20% of the ports at the level three level. And then we're kind of putting 60% of the level twos in commercial areas and 40% in residential. 
It, what's a 25% increase? Like, like, what do we have now? What, what, what is that? What number of cars does that represent? Oh, uh, I don't know, but it I just, don't know. It's assuming yeah. that there's a that there's a you know as as people see more chargers, there's a there's going to be a greater adoption of the EV units. I don't Do know what that number would be on that. I don't remember the current number of EVs from the synapse that we right have there. currently. Yeah, the registration in the community. Yeah, uh, it's a, r a little over um, six hundred yeah. uh, as of the twenty twenty two data. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you do the math out on that. It's twenty five percent growth of that. Yeah. year over year but exponential yeah right? okay. but exponential yeah this is so this is a little bit more uh, friendly visual this basically <laughs> shows the number of ports that we're going to install in each each year mm -hmm. so this is not a not cumulative it's the number of new installs so you can see we're planning to install every year more ports than we installed the year before what are the two colors uh sorry yes uh the green one, the top one is level two ports. This <coughs> goldish one is fast chargers, DC fast chargers or level threes. So, it, so overall. It should be like a bar. Huh? It should be a bar, not a line, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you could oh, visually show it as a bar. Oh, yeah, we could do it as a bar, yeah. yeah. You yeah. could visually show it's it as a bar. It's not cumulative. It's not cumulative, yes. No, I think, I think what, they were, I think what right. we're trying to visually show is that uh, the, that kind of increase in growth of the, of the number of chargers in the area. But you're right, cumulative, it should show mm -hmm. almost like a stepped approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the total number of ports, essentially, from now until 2030 is 200. Some level, mostly level twos, some level threes, but right. 200 ports over the next seven years. So then we, you know, we said, okay, where, what makes a good spot for a charger? Um, thinking about commercial locations or business districts in the city, you know, uh, proximity to multimodal transportation, amenities, tourist attractions. We looked at the load factor or kind of usage level of our current chargers and which chargers get a lot of, you know, a lot of folks using them, which ones are not used so much. Uh, we considered um, from a distribution system perspective, ability for expansion, um, you know, where we have room on circuits, where, um, where there's space for cars. Um, and then also thought about where might there be opportunities as DPW plans, you know, street work or their, their capital improvements, could we leverage and take advantage of those projects? Uh, the on the residential side, we considered housing density. Uh, we considered uh, Justice 40 or disadvantaged community census tracts. We thought about where there might be synergies with local organizations. Uh, again, looking at multimodal transportation, um, we've sort of put a pin in the idea of in certain areas of the community, maybe not picking a precise spot yet, but going into that neighborhood or that area and saying, hey, we want to put some chargers in, here's some ideas and getting community input and then ultimately picking the spot with that engagement considered. Um, we thought about lighting and safety. Um, we thought about, uh, for the grant, one of the requirements was that um, it's not, it can't be restricted access. So it can't be like an employee only parking lot or a customer only parking lot. It's okay to park charge parking fees, mm -hmm. but it has to be open to the public. The site has to be open to the public. This is busy um, and hard to see on your, <laughs> on your screen, uh, but it's uh, generally what uh, I want you to get the sense of here is that each of these things here is a neighborhood. So this is like downtown, and then this is the rank order of the kind of neighborhoods by how well we thought they met our criteria. So no surprise, downtown <laughs> met all the criteria for the best place to put a commercial uh, you know, in a commercial area to put a charger. And, you know, in the new north end, it didn't go score so well because there's less commercial activity there and it's highly residential. Um, so this is kind of showing, uh, you know, how the neighborhood scored and then we used that kind of scoring of the neighborhood to think about, okay, how many ports should we drop in each neighborhood 
over time? And how do we sp spread the new ports out among the different neighborhoods based on the suitability of those neighborhoods um, given their criteria? It's interesting the Old North End scored low because they have high housing density, they have a lot of commercial. This density. is commercial, yeah. Uh, they scored, they scored yeah. well, they scored better well. on residential. Yeah, if you actually look at yeah, the, um, yeah, the Old North So here, residential, downtown still scores well, but Old North End, kind of commercial area, Winooski Ave, and the sort of more residential areas of the North End um, scored number two and three, respectively. You know, the DC fast charger takes a much larger footprint, so that kind of also limited, limits a lot of space down in that part of the part of the city, aside from saving the shops down there. I was gonna, I'm saying the old North End, not the oh, Sorry, the new, yeah, sorry, the old North End, even worse, but yeah, the, uh, uh, the DC fast charger itself really means kind of an open parking spot and a parking lot, whereas um, the level two chargers, we actually have a pole mounted one that we're going to be rolling out that makes it a little bit easier to throw some out there. So, all right, so I'm going to go to move a little, hopefully a little bit better visual. Okay, so let me explain all the pins. This, this is some great mapping work that Freddie did. So the blue dots are where there is multifamily, subsidized multifamily housing. The green pins with stars are the proposed new charger sites and the orangey gold lightning bolt pins are where we have chargers now um, and so we and the uh, let's see the the red buildings are commercial I believe commercial buildings in this view <laughs> it's, it's tricky <laughs> um, so uh, so some of the spots we're looking at over the next seven years, um, the schools, so um, admins for the downtown area. Um, we thought about how uh, faculty, staff at the schools could charge during the day. After three o'clock, the parking lot is a lot less heavily used and community members, residents in the neighborhood could potentially use those chargers overnight. Um, so that you could, uh, you know, kind of serve kind of two groups of people potentially. Um, we thought about uh, city-owned properties, so the, the DPW City Market lot, the Fletcher Free lot, the Main Street. Um, Main Street, that's the corner one, I believe, on uh, by the fire station, uh, yeah, about by the fire station. Thank you. The super block, uh, the downtown garage. City Market's own private lot, potentially, the YMCA's private lot, potentially, and then potentially expanding um, next to our current chargers at Main and Church or Main and St. Paul. City Market, does, does City Market have any chargers at all? I think they have a couple. That's they have one, think they think but they I don't think anyone was using it and they closed it, right? They have I some here. I don't know if they have downtown some downtown. There's one, one, one in a one. very narrow space yeah, that's hard to park space. in. Yeah, yeah. And you gotta go in and get the key and then come out and yeah. unlock the charger oh. and put your thing in. So it's not that convenient right. either, mm -hmm. but people don't use it, yeah. yeah. So then the waterfront, this is an area we actually don't have any um, public charging right now. So this is on our near term list um, to add some public charging infrastructure. Um, there's a number of park-controlled <coughs> parking lots, of course, with Perkins Pier, the waterfront lot, uh, Battery Park, uh, the sort of lot near the sailing center, the Lake Street is extension <coughs> lot. Um, and then we have uh, a few 2030 district members on the waterfront, the sailing center, Echo, and Main Street Landing. So quite a few potentials, we think. Uh, I'm surprised you don't have the lot where and Deep City and uh, all those businesses are because the, the, the thing is full all the time. There's well, nothing that would there. be the uh, yeah. the Lake Street extension lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we don't have any in this area right now. Is that, that lot is prime for this, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Old North End, let me show you what this, so the colors on this map are a little different. This is showing the residential housing density so the green is less dense and the orange, um, yellow, orange, red is the more dense. Um, and so here we're thinking about uh, the two schools, we're thinking about the, the two parks, the community center, but then you can kind of see there's some, 
some holes here, right, where there's no park, there's no school, there's no DPW lot, um, and here, and but there is, uh, you know, a, f a decent amount of, of housing density. So these would be potentially the areas where we'd be looking at the pole mounted charger, yeah. The pole mounted on street option where we might do some community engagement to think about, you know, what would people feel is more most safe, most mm -hmm. accessible? Would they like them sprinkled all over the place? Would they like a sort of central all the chargers are here kind of spot? Um, and get some feedback. Right, because Pomeroy Park and Roosevelt, they don't have any parking associated with those parks. Mm -hmm. So you're talking yeah. about um, street parking on the <coughs> perimeter of the park. Correct. And, but you can use the city-owned land to host the charger? Is that the Yeah, idea? that's the general idea. Yeah, but yeah, that'd be the plan around those spots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what, and then you just get an excuse from residential parking or whatever that if there's any restraint. Yeah, we'll have to work with DPW, and we've had some initial conversations on them mm -hmm. around, you know, charging and resident permit only, and you know, kind of how do the various ordinances and rules governing parking in the city work. Um, we've also had some discussions about um, potentially making the public charging rate time of use because. Okay, so it's uh, right now our public charging rate is what it is all times of day. Most folks who use it are not Burlington residents, right? But if you are a renter who doesn't have off-street parking and a place to charge at home, right, you shouldn't be penalized and pay a higher rate by having to use a public charger. So if we put a pull mounted charger, you know, on your block, right? and then you park there on the street as a renter, mm -hmm. is there a way that we can make the rate you pay more equitable with the home charging rate that your neighbor who has <coughs> a, you know, a garage or a driveway right, is, is able to obtain? So we've got some, some tariff parking <laughs> things to work through, um, but it was, this, this whole conversation with this team kind of started to surface those issues, and um, so it, I think we have some, some good working uh, concepts and models to, to refine. So part of your, your public engagement would perhaps, and I have one parking lot in mind, um, would bring out perhaps other ideas, kind of like what I'm thinking. I'm just thinking, look at our office at the Channel 17, 294 Wadooski Avenue. Hot yoga and the the the, the, the that that's another lot that's always Axel. full, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. completely full all the time. <laughs> and so, and would 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 you engage with the, the, that's a privately owned? Mm -hmm. <coughs> would, mm -hmm. would would that be part of the for discussion? Engaging with private owners like that to see if perhaps some you know night parking would be okay for folks that are that might choose to be able to choose because there's also heavy residential right there too. Right. They slip right. in there at night and, and charge up their cars. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, places like that. Yeah, now. I, I just think, think of areas like this. That discussion has to happen with private lawn owners to see if we have other opportunities like that. So yeah, I agree with you there. And we've got some precedent. You know, the new North End near the Hannaford. So that's a, a privately controlled lot, right? So uh, we've done it before. We have some at UVM. Those are UVM controlled parking, but they're open to the public. Um, so, yeah, we've yeah. had those discussions and we've used private lots before, and so uh, definitely those are not off the table. Um, we were just, you know, trying to, the, trying to go with the city controlled and then right. sort of maximize that city resource uh, sure. as, a, as, a first, uh, as a first strategy. Oh, come on. There we go, okay. Uh, and then looking at the new North End, um, the new high school was an important opportunity. The schools there, expanding what we have at the shopping center, potentially. Um, we thought about uh, Northgate and the density there, a number of parks in the new North End. Um, and, and the parks department mm -hmm. also has reached out to us to express interest. They would like to have you know more chargers at just about, you know, chargers at all the parks, right, would be their ideal goal, so. Um, East End, um, 
the hospital is an opportunity, expanding at Champlain or UVM, Schmanska, maybe yeah. Gardner's Supply, um, Chase maybe the Chase Mill. Um, and then sort of looking at these, uh, sort of the college student neighborhoods along North and South Willard, Union, and Winooski. Those are really high density, not a lot of off street parking. Um, so we'll have to you know, think about how to serve those neighborhoods. There's not, um, not a ton of like parks or public facilities in those areas either. But the street is public right of way. Yeah. Yes. We do, I mean, that's mm -hmm. ours. Right. Um, of course, you gotta be careful with bike lanes too. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then finally, South End, we've got Champlain Elementary. Uh, we think the Market 32, TJ Maxx Absolutely. lot, that's right, a is a big opportunity. That's big one of the sites that's yeah. on our list actually for this fiscal year to put a fast charger there and capture some of perhaps the south, you know, the Route 7 commuter, uh, sorry, tourist, right, sure. traveler traffic. What about across the street? Shaw's. Shaw's, not, I mean, uh, we don't have that South Burlington. Burlington. That's that's South. Really? Yeah. Okay, wow, I didn't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not our territory. It's is. another that's great what, parking lot. Yeah, yes, we want to we want to get that <laughs> intersection <laughs> first. <laughs> Hickok and Boardman, is, that's where it is. That's the line, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to GMP. <laughs> <laughs> They're busy. <No>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, um, so that's kind of the overview of the neighborhoods and our, our thoughts on sites. Uh, just a little bit about the grant, as I said, 200 ports. Um, we've estimated that to be about six and a half million dollars. Um, if we are awarded the grant, we'll have to kick in 20 percent. The federal government will cover 80 percent. Um, and as I said, we'll focus on publicly owned properties, but if a private property owner is willing to make the location publicly available, um, definitely, uh, yes. definitely it's something to consider and open to that. Does that count as local match too? Is there a, that would be the local match. Would be if they, if some, oh, if, oh. Or like if a private property owner provided the space, does that count? Hmm. I don't know. It could maybe. <laughs> mm, are there initial thoughts for how to finance our share? Uh, revenue bond primarily. Yep. So that was what we had. Um, how about you take questions? Questions. I just wonder, um, you know, given the spatial inhomogeneity, as we say, uh, it's tough to to think of things this way. But if this is done, to what degree does that cover the problem, quote unquote, as you envision it? What percentage of charging sessions we can anticipate being demanded by the cars you assume and so on would actually be dealt with by this? I don't know if that's a question I can answer. It's, it's more, that's more of a, like a Freddie, Freddie and the trending question. and the policy and planning. Uh, I'm sure that was taken into consideration yeah. while we were rolling it, out. It's a tough one for sure, but I'm still thinking about, yeah. and you know, the 15 second message, you know, why should I get an electric car because X? And you say, no, no, this program is going to allow uh, so many cars, et cetera. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. See if there's anything. I mean, like we said earlier, you know, one of the hurdles is the access to charging. So we're trying to lessen that hurdle a little bit. Um, so, yeah, to, Freddie could provide a little bit more insight, or somebody from policy and planning could provide a little bit more insight on how they model it and what they anticipate for the trends. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, this seems to be one of the major charges is that we're just trying to lower that barrier of entry. I, I think again, a public yeah. perception is when you say access, it's that there's a line at the charger ahead of me, yeah. and each person is there for 30 minutes, that sort of thing. Right. right. Uh, not, not just. A, I can't get. I can't get parking because somebody else is parked in that spot. Right, right. or free parking for Tesla, right? Like that also doesn't sit well with people. Agreed. Um, mm -hmm. Or priority for the wealthy, yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. And it'd be good to know because uh, you know, we're starting presumably behind. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, we can certainly follow up on that yeah. and get you an answer by email. I'm, well, I'm, yeah, I'm not saying there's an answer oh, okay. at this point. <laughs> what is saturation? Yeah, you just have yeah. to know. Right. It's a good mm -hmm. point. Good question. Uh, yeah. This, this, if I'm reading the slide correct, it sounds like his model is assuming the chargers are used about 50%. And so it's. Um, right. Yeah, he's, he's assuming that he's assuming that 50% of the chargers is, are going to be used. So you need to install about twice as many, many chargers right. to cover what they anticipate for the EV demand there. And then to your point, uh, with a line at the charger, uh, that's discouraging for somebody. It's just like waiting in the line at, you know, a fueling station. You know, you're sitting there going, well, I got to keep waiting for this mm -hmm. car to charge. But if you have one just down the street that you can hitch up to um, and get the charge you want, or if there's enough on the street so that everybody can park and just leave their car overnight, that's uh, definitely uh, enticing for mm -hmm. folks. But it's interesting to think about how it will change the sort of streetscape and kind of, you know, driver mm -hmm. behavior and, right, like we have a lot of cars, we have a lot of parking lots. Right now, EV chargers are kind of the anomaly <laughs> and EVs are the anomaly. But if you sort of envision a future where more cars are EVs than not EVs, kind of what, what does that portend then, right, for the way our streets are set up, the way our parking lots are set up, the way that charging infrastructure is kind of integrated mm -hmm. into our public infrastructure. And, you know, planning's interested in that conversation, DPW's interested in that conversation, and, you know, that's, <coughs> we're, we're reaching out to those departments to kind of get them thinking and, and have them be engaged as, as we roll these out. Because we don't really, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of it that's unknown exactly, right. you know what behavior will be like and um, what demands, how demand will shape that. Plus we have autonomous coming. So autonomous vehicles also mm -hmm. potentially changing right. things. But right. yeah, that's a, can't know for sure. Any other questions? Thank you. That was Thank very you. informative Thank you. and encouraging. Emily. <coughs> um, <laughs> moving on, um, I'm going to ask, um, do we, uh, the next subject, which is uh, we're expecting an executive session, are we looking for a vote out of that, or is that strictly informative? This is informative. And so the reason I'm asking <coughs> is I'm wondering if we can do the, the commissioner check-in first here, and then... Um, kind of end the public part of the meeting with with that and then go uh, to our executive session and kind of be, be, be done. Um, but I think that would be the best thing to do. That Just way. Which means that I'm the one holding which means, everyone up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to hold Travis up or this gentleman uh, without waiting for us for anything. So as long as there's not a vote coming up, that's, that, was, does that sound fair to commissioners? Yeah. Yeah. If, if it's legal, sure. If it was, it's, yeah. So let's, uh, we'll finish here in the public section here with Commissioner Chicken. Any last uh, thoughts, ideas, whatever questions uh, still lingering from the course of the meeting? No? Okay. I have one thing, um, and it's the anticipating the lighting questions that we make for next year. Do you know what streets you're going to? be changing lighting on next year. And I'm just curious, I mean, we don't have to solve this at this moment, but I do think it makes sense for if, if because it's happened, uh, I think two or maybe three years in a row, like that the lights go in, people get angry, they didn't. So what can we do to avoid that for next spring? And is it, if we know now what streets are gonna get light posts changed, when do we plan out a community engagement conversation about the placing and the, those posts so that we can be in front of the conversation instead of behind? I think that would be something that the commission would, I would like to be interested in seeing. It. I mean, I know district energy is big and whatever, that might take a couple of meetings, but it, November, December might be a good time for us to talk about that and then prepare for a conversation, maybe March, April, for, before installations in June or July. And what's the question? The question is, um, <laughs> did you agree that we should be doing something like that? And do we already know what streets that they are? Like, okay, okay. yeah. Not light levels. 
not light levels, okay. but are you going to change the polls? And are people going to be surprised when their polls are? Yeah, we, can bring, I mean, we can bring something in the next meeting. Yeah, we can certainly. Yeah, or maybe November is better. Yeah, I'm actually not going to be here. We can certainly look into what next fiscal year is. <laughs> yeah, November is great. What well. next fiscal year is going to consist of. <laughs> yeah. But to your point about uh, community outreach, we've actually uh, adopted that across all capital projects. So when it goes into a residential neighborhood, whether we're touching streetlights or not, we're actually doing street walks with all of the any resident that's interested that's to idea. discuss it so that we well, so. I was going to say in previous meetings we've discussed that yes. that going yes. forward a, a bit more public Not engagement, just the yeah, yeah. yeah. Just a bit more would, would alleviate right. those things coming to us. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll definitely take a look and see what the what street lighting would be for next fiscal year. Um, and we can okay. certainly tell you what we're working on this fiscal year as well. Um, I can compile that for the next meeting. Okay. Did you say November? You weren't going to be. I'm not going to be in November. But October you would. Maybe virtually, yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts for commissioners? All right, the last thing we're, we're so we're done with the public part of the meeting. The last uh, uh, item on our agenda is a cybersecurity update. Uh, we're going to do that in executive session, but if uh, if General Manager Springer could just tee that up as, as whatever public statement that can be said about that, and then or, or uh, just just basic kind of be idea of what we're going to talk about, and then we'll uh, we'll end it from there. Well, we've got Erica here to Erica. lead the conversation. I won't say anything uh, in public <laughs> session about anything, but well, just, uh, yeah, that, just, that just I should so that at least the public has yeah. some, something of an idea of what we're talking about. But I think it, it, it's good practice um, for us to regularly update the commission on cybersecurity uh, practices, uh, issues, items. I'll let you know what our team is working on to be proactive. I think I, I want to applaud Erica's leadership and her team on this issue. Uh, has been incredibly uh, dedicated and proactive, uh, and I believe you're you're the lead rep uh, for the utility group, right? With the am I state, the, the state cybersecurity advisory council, the yeah. newly formed this year. So Erica is playing a leadership role, I think, within the utility community as well, and um, so this is really just good practice for us to be able to provide these types of updates. Um, and with that, I. I Hold any other thoughts unless you have any other introductory uh, The only thing I will add is that in, in our current day and age, cybersecurity is important. And, you know, the more that we can focus on it, the more that we can share, um, at least at this level, to the commissioners, I think it's important that you're aware of what, what we're doing and where we're spending money. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Um, should we go upstairs or do we? No, we'll leave. We'll do it here? Yeah. We can do it here. I think. Yeah. So we'll, we'll send Travis out for hopefully it won't be too long. All right. Yeah. So that's at the end of the public part of this. We're going to do, the, we're going to talk about this in private and then come out and, and adjourn the meeting. Thank you for Sir, thank you for, you thank you for joining us. We appreciate I, it. I, uh, I appreciate you make me feel welcome and I Absolutely. appreciate your public service. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us this evening. That's the end of our public part of our meeting. As, as always, we meet on the second Wednesday of the month, 5, 525 here at 585 Pine. Please join us in the discussion. Thank you.